Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Calling all white trash freaks in a boogaloo down. This is double feature. What is a boogaloo down? You you wouldn't. My name is Eric, and uh, I'm here with Michael. Yeah. And we have two movies, as always, uh, as sometimes on the show. As always, as sometimes, we are doing two films, and we are doing The Sessions and Moonrise Kingdom. So this is a look at opposing development. We have uh, someone nearing their 40s who has never been with a woman uh, sexually. And on the completely other side of things, we have some runaways trying to enter into uh, independence, perhaps before their time. Can I, can I leave yet? Is it, <laughs> I'm scared. It's is it okay be... to be afraid of our show? No. I'm, I'm always afraid of our show. This week is a good week to be afraid. Again, the only two people on planet Earth, I think, that are afraid of Wes Anderson. If you're uh, already relishing how discombobulated your two hosts are going to become when we get to Wes Anderson, you can chapter right over all the spoilers in the sessions just to hear all the spoilers in the chapter that will be marked on the website that will begin Moonrise Kingdom. What I was thinking is you could actually listen to the sessions, which is uh, right up our alley, yeah. perfect for us to talk about. And then chapter over our awkward fumbling of Moonrise Kingdom. I think that would be a good idea. Sure, and then you'll find out what you're, what we're doing for the uh, the infamous Year Ender show. Oh my God, it's the last show of the year. Yeah. Next time, not this time. <laughs> this time we have Angelic William H. Macy. <laughs> he solves the thing we were trying to talk about on The Loved Ones the other week, which was uh, Welcome to the Human Race, Every Day Somebody Breaks Somebody Else's Heart. That was essentially the core of right. what I think we were getting at there. Um, also, Love is a Journey is the funniest fucking Love is a Journey <laughs> from this. Yeah, I got nothing else. It's uh, beautiful. So it's, uh, it's Ben Lewin, who himself is a polio survivor and a director I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, director I've never heard of, always exciting to me. Doing that sort of based on a true story, sort of, and lies thing mm -hmm. that is uh, Mark O'Brien this time right. on the show. Who's a real individual who actually wrote poetry and who uh, who wrote the article on which the film was based? Yeah, and then there's the thing we're talking about. Also, Adam Arkin is in this movie. <laughs> Adam before, Arkin does do. Before a, we roll into that, he does a lot of sleeping before he becomes a terrible husband for a moment. The director and actor of one billion TV shows. Yes, Adam Arkin, and this may not surprise you to learn, but was also on The West Wing. Uh, as apparently doesn't surprise me even a little. I want at some point for you to see an episode of the West Wing to find out it's not a giant rotating cast. It's actually about 10 people and they're just all showing up on our show for some reason. Uh, talk to me about the plot of this. Give me your quick plot take on the movie. Man in an iron lung decides to get laid. All right. So uh, I want to do the thing where we just, you know, elephant in the room. Yeah. This is a very incredibly far out premise. Yeah. And you're automatically put in that place that people always say is, oh, the weirdest stories are true life. You know, <laughs> you couldn't sure. make this stuff up. Eh. Well, I also just think Sundance. I think can. I, I um, always, I mean. I go, oh, yeah, it's some kind of indie film about, you know, a, a guy and I don't know, an iron lung and he's just trying to find love in the world. I have, uh, and, and this is going to seem really insensitive. But I have this thing. Um, so uh, Dustin Hoffman got all this acclaim for Rain Man, and sure, we saw um, we saw Jamie Foxx get the Academy Award for Ray, and um, now we have John Hawks who got all this critical acclaim for playing Mark O'Brien, mm -hmm. a man in an iron lung. And so before I say what I'm about to say, I do want to say that John Hawks is one of my favorite actors and he does a fantastically good job in anything I've ever seen him in from road racers to from dust till dawn to Deadwood to me and sure. you and everyone we know sure. to uh, now to this that said, is it that much harder to play a blind guy 
if you can see or play a guy who's laying in a bed, if you can walk around and move your arms. I get that maybe conveying certain things become more difficult if you can't move. Sure. But also that's just something the audience is going to go, well, of course that seems, of course that's difficult to convey because, because you can't move. Right. What I really want to see is I want to see Stevie wonder get an Oscar for playing a fucking baseball player, you know? Yeah. Simply being in an iron lung, I don't think is what deserves the acclaim here. Right. I mean, there was all that stuff about uh, how he had to arc his body and that kind of bunk story about his chiropractor said it threw his chi out of alignment or something. Whatever. But I think the stuff that uh, John should actually be given credit for is things like, you know, his delivery of humor in the film. Right. The, The entire fact that, all right, we're dealing with this movie that is, like I said, far out premise, just way, way fucking weird. Uh huh could be done in a lot of different ways and i think all of those ways but one are distasteful yeah and exploitative and you know uh todd browning's freaks uh is the infamous (laughs) well todd browning's freaks is the infamous example of can we go exploitation and still do heartfelt yeah yeah you know and i think (laughs) that becomes kind of the model for a lot of stories like this. Or you go the other direction and you go, let's pretend that this is just straight up drama, that there's nothing funny to it and that no one should snicker at the fact they just paid twelve and a half dollars to go, you know, to get a movie ticket to the film about the guy in the iron lung who's trying to have sex with a woman who's not a prostitute. It's hard to not giggle at that. I mean, I think everybody who goes to see this movie has to acknowledge that there's a little bit of giggle to it. Sure. But then John comes out and does you know the the way he's portraying this character humorously and sort of with a bit of a stride to him mm-hmm. and then you're still feeling for the guy i mean i don't know what in an actor's toolkit allows you to do that but i think it's being done here in every way that it you know that it needs to be well i think that i don't and i don't know if it's more of a credit to john hawk's performance or the writing or mark o'brien as a human being sure but I think that the allowance for the character comes deeply from the fact that he's a poet. Oh, sure. I didn't even think of that. That he gets to view things from an artistic standpoint and then speak incredibly eloquently about his feelings on a subject. Right. I mean, he's, he, his dialogue is written like poetry. Right. Everything he says comes from a place of very grounded astute beauty but that could also have gone just as wrong as it went well exactly you know what i mean yeah i'm i mean it's it's just let me let me repitch this to you a guy in an iron lung just wants to get laid so he writes poetry i mean it could be train wreck levels of disaster or you just tweak it and you go stand-up comedian in an iron lung wants to get laid right but the film's use of humor without going for the low-hanging fruit is really the thing that makes me feel so good about sure. it. Sure. And the fact that Mark's a funny guy. Right. Not unaware of his situation, but we're not using it, you know, for it's not premise or absurdity jokes. Mm-hmm. We never really stand back to go, wow, we are in a situation where I'm hiring a woman to have sex with me and I'm in an iron right. lung. Weird, huh? You know, we get that on more of a micro scale where certain events might have something that's a little funny or weird about them. But we're never standing back and mocking the premise because I think that undersells his emotional trip here. Well, and I think that the other characters' reactions to Mark, their genuine understanding of... Because let's be completely honest here. How often do you come upon somebody who's blind or, you know, they just have some sort of disability and immediately you start treating them differently sure. based on whatever you, I mean, well, sure. you know, there are people that talk to blind people louder, right? You know what I mean? Well, we just had this on that other show talking about Marley Matlin. Right. And I think that the characters in this, um, the, the priest and the sex surrogate and even the caretaker are all so human toward Mark that it allows mm-hmm. him to be a fully well-rounded person sure as opposed to constantly trying to compensate for the fact that they're being patronizing well and he deals with that right away exactly you know, that's the first thing he says when he has his confession is 
I want to fire this woman just because she looks at me like, you know, like I owe her something. And so we're showing that this is a world where those characters exist. It's right. much like real life. And we're just choosing to get rid of them because we don't want to do that. It also makes uh, his priest or whatever uh, aware that this is something he's very alert about and that he's consciously trying to remove that from his life. It's just like the jokes. It's just like the not pretending I'm not in an iron lung. He's not pretending that there aren't people who look at him weird. And he's right. You know, he's been through this most of his life. Well, and I think that the interesting thing about Mark as a character is what gets the film rolling is that he views his most intense handicap as the fact that he hasn't gotten laid. Sure. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is that once it it happens, he kind of feels like, oh, that that didn't change anything about who I am. Right. Or, or, or right. where I am in my life. Sure. Eventually, it does end up in this, you know, probably more independently of the true story is that that is the line that wins him the woman yeah. at the end. I think of that more of a joke. Though. Sure. Yeah, you know, I agree. It's, it's I an agree. icebreaker joke. And this is this is also fascinating that he just graduates from college. Sure. And the most difficult journey in his life is uh, making a woman come. As I was watching this, I was thinking a little bit about, you remember the movie Fur we talked about? Yeah. You know, it's one of those things as we're, we're seeing it, it's a little bit of a challenge to watch and to think about. But another thing I like a lot about uh, the sessions is seeing how much of a challenge it is for the characters in his life as well as him. I actually think one of the people who struggles the least might, you know, might be Mark. Mm-hmm. He comes into the world of this priest for the first time. And, you know, we also see the difficulty with his surrogates. And I had just mentioned, you know, finding assistance and firing different people and finding the right person. These people also have a really hard time dealing with Mark as well. Sure. They have a hard time dealing with him in the way that I think the audience does. So we get two different kinds of journeys there. We get to see the kind of journey of the regular vanilla audience member learning about some kind of social oddity. And then we also get to see that person having their own journey that we can invest in. Mm -hmm. But there are moments where, especially for his surrogate, uh, that first session they have, and she's trying to get yeah. his clothes off, and he's kind of yelling in pain. Mm -hmm. We get that scene where she's in the bathroom kind of looking at herself. I mean, I don't know what's going through her head at that point. But you've got to be thinking like, fuck, can I do this? Yeah. You know, this is something she kind of does for a living, but it still seems incredibly taxing for her. Right. Well, and that's the thing is, is Mark comes into these people's lives and causes them to question their foundation. Right. The one thing the sex surrogate knows is that she's comfortable with sex and she wants other people to be able to experience it. The one thing that the priest knows is that he is a man of God and God is you know, this way about certain tenets of the faith. The one thing that his caretaker knows is that she got this boy, the first caretaker, right? Or the second right. technically, but she's got this boyfriend and she's taking care of Mark. And suddenly Mark enters all their lives and the sex surrogate is going, can I do this with the no strings attached attitude? Is this something I can even give to him? The priest is going, ah, oh, God will give you a free pass, I guess. Well, the priest does have a lot of quiet. I mean, we, we can get to that later if you yeah. want, but the priest does seem to have just as many uh, worldview challenging questions about it. Sure. And then we have uh, then we have the uh, the second caretaker who falls in love with him or I guess doesn't yeah. fall in love with him. God, I fucking hate that. I'm glad as a poet he can recognize that. It's really interesting for me to see somebody, especially somebody who's religious, play out a thought experiment on film to go, you know, uh, his priest talks about it all the time that he has these canned answers for things that that's part of his job is just delivering this sermon, delivering this speech. I have this little knowledge bite when people ask me these things. And suddenly he's challenged with, well, is it okay to break commandments? Is it okay to go against what the Bible says because of my special circumstance, because of you know the position that I'm in? And I mean, maybe this is just credit to William H. Macy, but God, do you see him very visibly struggle with that? Oh, yeah. There are these reaction kind of shots when Mark says things mm -hmm. that are just, 
fuck, I'm in over my head. I don't know. I have no idea. What do you think we should yeah. do? You know, it keeps asking him as a friend, what would you do about this or that? What do you think God would do? It's causing more of a crisis, I think, in yeah. his priest than in Mark himself Sure. to go, well, what is God going to think about this? Do I get a pass? You know, these are very, very difficult, even grayer lines than the fucking Bible already has Right. to think about how do I keep inside this code? And I look at that less as a religious person and just as a person who has certain codes or, or guidelines they live by, and then finding an exciting new circumstance you've never thought about before. Mm-hmm. That's part of the the great, great reason a movie like The Sessions exists, is to explore a world you know nothing about, and to see people struggle with uh, not just the hardships, but also the kind of moral, ethical, the different questions this raises that you never would have had to think about you know, yourself. It's one of my favorite things that film can do. I think it's one of the core purposes of film is to explore worlds you could never go to Mm -hmm. or think about things that you've never had an excuse to think about for any other reason. Kind of figure out more about how you feel on different issues, which actually brings me to the sex surrogate. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind indulging me in a, in a bit of hypothetical conversation. Oh, sure. On the topic, because that seems like something the sessions is begging for. Um, she makes this distinction between prostitute and sex surrogate. Uh And I think the work that sex surrogates do uh, in making people comfortable with sexuality is really powerful and incredibly Mm -hmm. noble, I guess, in a way. But I also think that about sex therapy for people who don't necessarily have a disability or any type of therapeutic sexuality or just uh, helping people with their level of you know, comfortability being naked or in sexual circumstances. So having said that, I mean, she draws this difference, but do you think the difference between a sex surrogate and a prostitute is arbitrary? Or do you see a reason for society to keep those in two separate kind of mental places? Uh, Oh man, that was a twofold question, wasn't it? It certainly was. No, I think that a sex surrogate is not doing the same thing as, um, as a prostitute let's 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 try to dial it into a situation that's a lot easier to understand i think that a prostitute is the expendables (laughs) and that a sex surrogate is a war training video I uh, I see what you're saying. The goal of the expendables is you're supposed to go there. You're supposed to have a really good time. And then you're supposed to want to go back for expendables two and expendables three. And there'll be some new tricks and it's going to get bigger and crazier. But eventually you're going to blow your load every time. (laughs) But you go to a war training video and you come out of there with a profound respect for war and a very deep understanding for how to perform in that situation that you will be safe and that everybody you're doing it with will be okay with that situation. That's the intention, but this is the part that doesn't hold up for me. I mean, there's a couple parts that don't hold up for me, but let's stick with your analogy for a minute. She says the goal here is that she does not want them to continue after six sessions. I mean, that's the rule, right. but that's, that's her distinction. Right. I mean, that's not Mark's distinction. He would love for it to continue. And I think most people who have, you know, their first sexual experience with somebody, she even talks about how natural it is that they have a sort of post-copulation, sure. you know, intimacy, uh, romantic attachment. And while she says, okay, I'm just going to train you to do this. And after six times, you'll be able to go do it comfortably on your own. I think the person who is on the, uh, the patient end of that often has those attachments, not even necessarily unhealthy attachments. I think pretty natural attachments. Well, yeah, I think that that's normal. I think if you're if you're in a training situation in a class, you develop an attachment to the class, to your classmates, to being safe there as opposed to being in a real situation. So, I mean, take that even one step back. It's the same fear and excitement for graduating high school. Mm -hmm. Part of you is terrified because everything you've known that has been comfortable for you for the last four years is now about to be a thing that you will never experience again. But on the other hand, prostitutes. So, (laughs) (laughs) so the actual, uh, 
So we can dabble in analogies a lot, but I think the thing uh, at the root of why I feel like there's little to no distinction there, or societally there shouldn't be, I feel like very few people question sex surrogates, Uh but the world's oldest profession of prostitution is often called into moral, ethical questions. Okay. Isn't there a hate? I mean, you'd have to agree there is some kind of gray line between expendables type no strings attached, pay for sex, want to go back and get it, and therapeutic sex. Let's even say out of the the realm of rehabilitation. But there are people who are emotionally scarred in situ. What about, uh, let's say, somebody who was a victim of some kind of brutal sexuality, Mm -hmm. Um, rape, or just some sort of sexual assault, and they can't have sex that is pleasurable for them emotionally. So they start seeing somebody so that they can kind of get over with an impartial person the awkward, you know, dealing with uh, their own body and feeling clean and safe and healthy and fun about sex again. Yeah. That would be therapeutic. Correct. But that's something you might not want to do with someone you're going out with. It might be really awkward and difficult emotionally. Maybe you want to do it with a therapist. Mm-hmm. That's still in the line of sexual surrogate, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. But you're not physically, you know, it's not physically impossible for you to go meet somebody else to have sex with. So I think that blurs things a little bit. Well, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that you have to be in an iron lung to go to military classes. (laughs) I'm saying you have to be in a situation where you require military training. Okay, but where's the line? I I mean, if I've cried during sex before, should I be able to see a sexual surrogate? Does that qualify me? You know, I I certainly have very disturbed emotional problems. And sometimes they're revealed during sex. I mean, does that make me a candidate? I think the situation is very simple. I think if you believe you have an honest sexual problem and you contact a sexual surrogate, they're going to assess your situation and they're either going to go, you just want to fuck something. Or they're going to go, okay, maybe there's something there. And after one session, they're going to know whether to have you back for another session. (laughs) That's a, you know, it's a line, I guess, best left to the professional. I definitely think that the stigma of prostitution shouldn't be there. That's what I meant by it being a twofold question. I don't think there should be a stigma. (laughs) Sure, we're both on the same page Akin to prostitution that isn't there for sex surrogates. But I definitely think that prostitution is recreational and sex surrogates is therapeutic. There's a place in my head uh, that, you know, sexuality, especially as we've treated it on our show, is a very fun and very recreational thing, can be very fun and recreational. But I think for a lot of people, it can be therapeutic as well for our dark indie film uh, fans, for our foreign film fans. Sure. I'm very close friends with a girl who was a call girl for many years. And she would tell me these stories about people that she had seen. And the thing that was, you know, you expect weird sex party stories. And there were plenty of those too. But the thing that shocked me the most was how much these people almost couldn't have sex with people they met. They had such emotional problems. And a lot of times it would be less sex and more talking Mm -hmm. or more companionship. Some of the things we talked about in the girlfriend experience. People pay for something like the girlfriend experience, a girl who will, you know, sleep over and have pretend dates and you can buy her gifts because they can't do that for free or it's easier for them to pay money for it. And I think when you actually get closer to what happens, you know, once the door is shut uh, and somebody pays for a woman to sleep with them, then you notice that it's uh, it's a lot closer to therapy for a lot of people than, you know, they probably want to let on. Anyways, completely off the uh, off the deep end of the sessions, but interesting nonetheless. This is definitely a week where we're trying to play catch up with the rest of the world. Yeah, who gets Wes Anderson? Who's totally on board? Mm-hmm. And we were feeling pretty good after Miranda July last week, and we <laughs> said, "Fuck it, let's just let's go for it." But that's the uh, that's the accessibility thing. Tackle it without a plan. We're just going to go, well, let's watch the movie. Which one? I don't know. The, the last fucking one. And yeah. we'll see what happens. So I wanted to talk about our avoidance right away. I don't know if much more needs to be said on that, <laughs> except that we are aware that we've been doing this a long time. And Wes Anderson's one of those people that 
everybody writes us about. Sure. And we just go, eh, I don't really, uh, do you know anything? I Royal don't, I don't Tenenbaums know. is one of those things that's, I mean, Royal Tenenbaums is up there with Blade Runner. It's one of those movies that, <laughs> right. the thing with Blade right. Runner and Royal Tenenbaums and most Wes Anderson for me is that I saw it at a time that I wasn't quite aware of film. Sure. But I was still in a place where I saw it knowing that it was notable. And I watched it and went, I don't see why this is a big deal. Yeah. And then everybody around me went, oh, my God, the royal <laughs> sure. fucking Tenenbaums. Sure. And I went, uh-oh, uh, is something wrong with me? Well, let's try the getting on board thing as, as much as we can immediately. We'll just throw things and see what sticks. I mean, I'm watching the movie and I'm thinking about the themes I've seen of other Wes Anderson movies and some of the broader themes and some of the more narrow, just little, you know, killing the dog type. Yeah. That's kind of a theme for Wes Anderson. He's very cruel to the animals, especially after yeah. I went off about pets uh, last week. <laughs> I, I think, oh, I can totally get behind this guy. But um, when you see this movie or when you think about Wes Anderson, what do you think we can get on board with right away? I think that Wes Anderson is a perfect double feature director because he does the things we like. He has an acting troupe. He has a recurring set of actors that come back and play quirky characters. His films are very stylized. They look very similar. He's got a definite vision. He's a writer director. You know his stuff when you see it. He is yeah. the bullet list of what double feature likes in uh, a filmmaker. Sure. And the result is pretty definitely with Moonrise Kingdom uh something that I like but as we talked about last week that doesn't stop me from trying not to like it every time <laughs> I know there is a weird gut thing right where you go ah oh, Wes Anderson that's not my guy I'm not on that team yep you know <laughs> but if you would have if we would have taken the blind taste test here and that's something we we keep trying to do over and over is go ah oh, these people we don't like what if we take away their name and their title and their work, which honestly is the most important, but we just go, I mean, listen to that list you rattled off, right? Yeah. If it's stylized, if it's got a reoccurring cast, if it's got um, consistent themes and perhaps most importantly, the writer director sort of. Sure. Deals with taboos. I mean, it's yeah. got everything. We talk about these all the time. We would go, yeah, sign me up for that. That sounds like a, who is that guy? Tell me about oh, Wes Anderson. Oh, I don't like him for some reason that I can't put my yeah. finger on that I've never really spent any time actually considering. I don't, I don't like go him. to see his movies and think, God, I really hated that. And no, it's just wrong. And it's, but I hear oh, a new Wes Anderson movie coming out and I go, that's not my team. And I don't know why. Put I put my to... fingers in my ears and hum for a year right. so that I don't right. have to hear about Darjeeling Limited. Right. Why? I don't know why I do. That's wrong. It's I shouldn't totally be doing wrong. that at all. It's probably no, good. What the fuck is wrong with us? <laughs> well, right. His kingdom was great. I had a great time. Yeah. With it. I don't know what the fuck my problem is. Um, other thing I think we know a little bit, so we'll just try and stay in that territory, is uh, Roman Coppola, who is the son of Francis Ford Coppola. Okay. A name we've heard on the show. Mm -hmm. And somebody whose movies we found, uh, you know, he's got some roots. He's got some history in the, the old stab and slash and that was somebody who I think is, I mean, it's totally unfair to start talking about Francis Ford Coppola when he has nothing to do with this movie. It's, you know, a son. <laughs> Grasping at straws, man. I wanted to bring him up more specifically for being another example of a director where I think both you and I went, ah, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, he's like one of those, those film guys. I don't really, I don't care about now, that. right? Yeah, that's yeah. scary. But then we saw the conversation and we went, oh, fucking brilliant. This right. is great. This is right up our alley. It's got some brief horror moments. We found out about Dementia 13 and did that on our show. Mm -hmm. And we went, oh, never mind. This is totally our guy. Sure. Uh, Roman Coppola, he did a lot of second unit with Francis Ford Coppola. So we might have seen a little of his stuff. But he's also worked with Wes Anderson a lot before. And he brings a lot to the writing of this movie. Things like the, uh, you know, their mother on a megaphone. Mm -hmm. Events that actually happened in Roman Coppola's life. Which are pretty uh, pretty amazing to think about Francis Ford Coppola's wife running around with a bullhorn. Mm -hmm. So the next most comfortable thing for me, if people haven't picked up on this uh, yet, we're not going to get a lot to the, <laughs> the content of the film. But this is something that it's, you know, treading lightly, one foot in front of the other. I want to talk about the visual treatment. That is, I mean, that is probably for me the most obvious thing in a Wes Anderson movie. So we've... We've uh, 
dived in pretty deep into visual aesthetics in films, we're, we're starting to pick up a lot of subtlety and a lot of nuance. And I know that's me being gabby about cameras. But now we have the ability to go back to somebody who's widely understood as a visual director by people who aren't, you know, 10 levels deep into staring at camera lenses and so forth. Right. I'm curious to kind of get your take about it as somebody who only by contrast has to be slightly less visually oriented of the two <laughs> of us. You're still a fairly fit, uh, visually oriented person, but I'm curious to hear what you think the sort of the visual hallmarks are of a movie like this and his other stuff. Well, I know the the big thing that I, kn- I mean, that I think everybody knows about Wes Anderson is the color palettes. That sure, every sure, single one of sure. his films follows a specific, what, six or seven color palette. I think it's a meme now. Is it a meme? I have seen that before. I didn't, yeah. it had been so long ago, I forgot about yeah, that. So there's, yeah, so there's the color palettes where the films all live in the same color scheme and, and that ties everything together and uh, it downplays a lot of um, what could be a really vibrant visual aesthetic and instead gives it a very tame and controlled look Mm -hmm. which i think is a perfect contrast to things like children getting struck by lightning yeah the color palette is something that we don't talk a lot about visually but controlling your color palette down to just a few different uh, multiple shades of a few different colors does give your film a really really striking look and especially when they're muted colors, mm-hmm. like you mentioned here. I mean, I think brown is always on that mm-hmm. palette. It's actually just a game of how many shades of brown. It's always earth tones. Wes right. Anderson walks outside in September and pulls like five <laughs> leaves off a tree and goes, this is my color palette. I just think it's really striking visually. I think more people should do that. Mm-hmm. I love seeing things in a color palette. It's hard because you have to think about your film so uh, carefully to guard that those other colors aren't there, and then also in your color grading. My natural instinct when I see a Wes Anderson film is to get out my eyedropper tool and pick out the white and instantly balance it and ruin his his aesthetic choice. Uh, You don't see those kind of pure whites in Wes Anderson movies. You see that that tint to throw things back into the palette. Mm -hmm. So even white is being considered inside that, you know, shifted inside that and palette. this is another thing that that uh it ruins everything that we know about film uh he ignores the rule of thirds to oh, yeah. every degree <laughs> right he throws it yeah. in the center and then he pans backwards it's never sure. from right sure. to left it's never from left to right it's always we'll put things in the middle and then we'll go backwards so that more things land in the middle yeah if right. there are two things they will be equally distanced from the middle right it's really interesting in this film because it opens on a on a painting Mm -hmm. which for me is always just i mean with moonrise kingdom specifically every scene is set up more like a painting than it is a film it's all kind of rockwellian photographs sure it's the norman rockwell photo shoot if i mean i i know i understand he does paintings let's not (laughs) uh it's the norman rockwell photo shoot between him saying, everybody freeze, I'm about to take a picture. Actually, I can think of uh, two instances where the camera is panning left or right that are used in a really distinct way. You know, we get into the home, and this is, I think, uh, kind of a staple for Anderson, is moving fluidly from one room to another. Mm -hmm. We're kind of getting a tour, and it's sweeping seamlessly I mean, we see the same when there's a a tour of the scouts. Sure. They're all in line. It's a long line. We're just going booth to booth. I mean, the amount of setup that must go into that is astonishing. You know, everything is a camera rig. Only for maybe two or three scenes in the whole movie does it seem like we get a steady cam or anything handheld. It's all on tripods, on mounts, on things that can move fluidly. The amount of forethought that goes into that it does put it back in the realm of paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, we're very carefully considering, we're almost pencil sketching the, uh, the live action scenes as we're filming them. We're going through what's kind of Kubrick levels of meticulous. Sure. I was reminded of Kubrick. Uh, I think toward the end, even the, the scene with the animal masks on the balcony, Yeah, you know, and the zooms when, uh, social services first arrives. It's kind of like that eyes wide shut scene we talked about, Uh but I mean more just in the detail and the amount of setup. It seems like it would take an eternity to fucking film this stuff. 
each scene is, you know, when you have stuff on rigs like that, there's no just kind of get the camera up there and point it at where the action is. You know, when you shoot handheld, that's something I like a lot about the the Handycam movies we've strangely gotten away from. I don't know why. we got to find some more of those. That you just kind of go where the action is and you try and line up the shots. It's a living art piece. Mm-hmm. You're going, all right, everybody run around and try and hit your marks. And I'm going to generally throw the camera in this area and correct it a little bit, you know, immediately when I see it. It's almost documentary style where this is everybody has to be dead on these marks. The camera's going to sit right here and that it's math. You know, right. It's going to move from this kind of framing to this kind of framing at exactly this time when these movements occur. And so you get these scenes that are almost like mini plays. You know, a guy narrates the camera, steps forward, flicks on a light on the camera. We rotate the camera 90 degrees to an entirely new framing that had to be set up before the camera was on it. We narrate, step forward, light off, boat comes from the left side of the frame. It's just this perfect, uh, almost Rube Goldberg uh, kind of setup to a scene. For people who aren't very visual, or maybe they've never seen a Wes Anderson movie, that's also (laughs) a possibility, I suppose, or they don't know what we're talking about. You know the scene where they have uh, the letters back and forth? Mm -hmm. I think Wes Anderson movies in general have the ability, they don't always use it, Uh, sometimes the takes are a little longer, but they can cover a lot of ground very quickly. Mm -hmm. We don't stay in the same places. Sure. We don't. I mean, I I guess I'll speak specifically to Moonrise Kingdom since that's what's in front of us. But look at like their adventure along the trail. Yeah. They're always, they're in a different part of the woods. They're in a different landscape. They're inside a tent. Even when we can't actually get out of the woods, we're going to go, well, let's stay inside this tent for a while. So we're mixing up visually where we're at all the time and we don't stay anywhere very long. We keep moving from place to place. I think the letters are really emblematic of that the way they go back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's a good example. We get a sentence and a half, and we don't leave the audience any time to get bored. I think that's one of the things people like about Wes Anderson movies is that ability to go from one thing to another. We read the first sentence and a half, and we go, okay, we get this letter, toss it aside, and move on to the next letter. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the music, because I think that's another component of the movie that's really important but I am so fucking out of my league that you have to, again, by contrast, at least be slightly less outside of your league than, uh, than I am. There's two big things with the music that I think are notable. And the first is the, the piece that's going on right at the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. The thing where they're talking about deconstructing the orchestra and how if you put it all together, it sounds like one thing, but here are the different things all happening it's as if it's a metaphor for right. the film, it's Michael. It's a very obvious metaphor. We should also say Wes Anderson pretty accessible, too. Oh, this yeah. might be the most accessible right. person we've ever been afraid of. Yeah. I think it's because I'm afraid to not understand any single piece of this. <laughs> so it's, it's, there's that. But then following that, it's pretty much just Hank Williams songs mm-hmm. that play on the radio. And it's, uh, I know that Kalija plays like three or four times throughout the film, which is a, it's an old Hank Williams song about a wooden Indian. Sure. It's weird, but it's also kind of interesting because the film is set in the 60s. Yeah. And uh, it's odd because we get films that we would maybe call period pieces or, you know, films set back in time. And the only time I can think of a film that is set back in you know, 30, 40 years ago, sure. 50 years ago mm-hmm. that I didn't sit there and go, yeah, I know. Cause I get it. It looks that way. And there, no, there's a reference to the president at the time. And <laughs> right. Right. Is the devil's rejects, which is another film that's in the seventies and halfway through the movie. I don't even care because the plot, <laughs> the plot, the plot of a film in the seventies is exactly as intriguing and investive as a film from 2013, they sure. just don't have cell phones. Sure, right. That's the difference. If you set your film back in time, uh, it allows you to do two things, and Wes Anderson takes full advantage. Nobody has a cell phone, and you can talk about events that are going to happen in the location that, sure. th- which uh, they have that weird Bob Balaban, um, the narrator, yeah. where he's talking about how three days from now there's going to be a storm. Sure, sure. Um, storms are coming and i think called some foreshadowing right and i think that i don't know really if hank williams has much more to do with 
the film other than kind of giving it a very grassroots old time feel to it. Hank Williams is particularly notable for being a voracious drug user and alcoholic who eventually died at a fairly young age. Sure. I don't know how that applies to Moonrise Kingdom. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I was more curious about the impact uh, on the feeling of the film the music has. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear, you know, you think that that's one of the critical components. It sounds like is it makes the film feel, uh, feel a certain way. I mean, a lot of it seems I, would you attribute a lot of that feeling to the music? Yeah, I think it, I mean, I think I attribute a lot of it to the music and a lot of it to everybody wearing tan. Oh, right. And you right. know what else is uh is the Maybe it's, you found a reason for the color palette. Right. It sets a mood. I also attribute it to uh children running away and not bringing electronics. Yeah, sure. Books. Right. Carrying books anywhere, things like mentioning a library. Right. It puts the film in this ver in this temporal state of permanence whoa which is i know like a total oxymoron but the film isn't going anywhere right however time is going to move forward yeah i didn't even think about that but there you know that's it's one of the things that uh another theme and a lot of wes anderson stuff is kind of absent parents i don't want to necessarily say running away but that's something that i don't know if i have a lot to say on it other than to endorse it that great childhood idea of almost being an empowerment film being these two kids met each other and they're going to get the fuck out of here. Right. A a runaway film and seeing that adventure unfold and trying to set a certain mood for that. So it doesn't just become, I mean, that's not the only thing about moonrise kingdom. That's why we're able to talk about all these other things. Right. But the visual palette and the sound lend itself to setting the kind of tone for the adventure where it's not scary. You know, all right. the adults are concerned the whole time. Everybody's trying to find these kids. It's really frightening. Dogs are dying. Yeah, right. So, I mean, with different color and different sound, this could be an entirely different movie. If this were a Marcus Nispel movie, the uh, <laughs> the guy who did what the Texas, the first Texas Chainsaw remake. Sure. Can you sure. imagine the gravity of this film if Marcus well, Nispel did about. this movie? That's what I'm talking about. You know, we could make There'd the be thing wolves everywhere, just wolves. The whole thing in uh, in really light blue and green tones. Yeah, and with uh, an edgier soundtrack, uh, or even even just silence, even silence mm-hmm. and no color grading. Just raw coming out of the camera right off the film. Uh, I don't think the movie would feel as warm and adventurous. Sure. And you wouldn't quite be rooting for everybody for <laughs> the success of the runaways. But yeah, you're right. Really, everybody, everybody in the film. There's no unlikable bit. characters in this film. Do you realize that? Even the even the bumbling characters. The bumbling are, characters, social services, who comes in as a fucking monkey wrench. You're like, yeah, you know, but she's right. a good time. Yeah, right. Tilda Swinton's well, kind of kicking ass. Yeah, you can't fault social services because if you're really going to stop and think about anything in the movie, social services is probably the one that right. It's actually in the There's right. The only the only character that you can even begin to dislike is um the one scout who has it out for uh, the protagonist. Oh, who has to be the foil, right? Yeah, but even him. I mean, he's got his you know his mo. He's a little fucking kid. It doesn't mm-hmm. even matter. Exactly. He certainly has his moments. I wanted to bring this up, too, and just kind of save it for last, but you had mentioned to me, in terms of approachability, that you think this actually has a lot in common with uh, John Waters, who we just talked about uh, a couple shows ago. I think that this is the other aspect of Wes Anderson that I love, and it's the fact that these films are comedies. Mm-hmm. Definitely comedies. We, sure. a few few films ago, uh, talked about Oh, uh, this could be a comedy dressed as a drama, dressed as depending on how you look right, at uh, palindromes. Right. So it's palindromes, but I think that this has so much in common with the old trash o John Waters movies. Right. Uh, we have an ensemble cast, uh, a group of people that we always like to see coming back. The difference is the budget and the fact that we're not trying to be terribly obscene and get a get a rush from people. Sure. But you have the same kind of dumb jokes all the jokes are dumb they are (laughs) lowbrow jokes in a tuxedo right the the which i mean things that we you know we would generally rally against but we love for john waters um the the thing that i'm the thing that i'm kind of specifically thinking about is um 
Ed Norton's character entirely <laughs> is just right. a John Waters character, but instead of being some ugly person in a fucking baby suit <laughs> is Ed Norton. And we're all like, oh, Ed Norton's a nice, clean guy. Yeah, right. He's smoochy. Right. <laughs> and then we also have um, Francis McDormand and Bill Murray's character, the married lawyers. Sure. Who refer to each other as counselor. I think this might be the first time we've ever seen Bill Murray on our show. Uh, There's a whole legend and lore yeah. to Bill Murray. We uh, need to discuss at some point, too. We'll do Garfield. Well, we should do more Wes Anderson stuff. That's but true. There's a, there's a cast that's, I think this is also the first one that doesn't have Owen Wilson. Right. It's capacity. also one of the earlier, one, or one of the few that Owen Wilson didn't have a hand in writing. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. no, I didn't know about that. And then uh, Jason Schwartzman and... Um, there's a little bit of Adrian Brody and some other Wes yeah. Anderson stuff. Although, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how much. But yeah, definitely an ensemble cast. Very Dreamlanders kind yeah, of cast. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of ragtaggy. Everything sure. that's going on is... if you So what we've talked about with John Waters is totally apropos for this film is the early Dreamlander stuff was, I don't know, look in the newspaper, what happened? Right. This is a film about some runaway scouts that ended up getting into a bunch of trouble that you know, they, it was a dangerous, dangerous night because of a storm. This sure. is, this is right. a fucking, this is a two column newspaper blurb <laughs> told right. with an ensemble cast through a comedic lens and all the characters are kind of oblivious to what's going on. How is that not John Waters? No, you're right. It is. Except for the fact that nobody is a transvestite. Well, most importantly, I feel like these are all friends making a film. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think that's a lot of what people, uh, I mean, I've asked people about Wes Anderson being a person I don't, I don't know uh, very well. And a lot of them echo that idea that, well, he and Bill Murray like making movies. You know, Bill Murray is notorious for not doing films he doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. You see all the same people appear uh, over and over in his movies. He's got Bruce Willis in here, who's uh, increasingly gaining a reputation of hard to work with mm -hmm. as an actor. And so all these people are coming together and they're putting on their goofy little movie where they all look like they're in on the joke. You know, you also hear stories about all of these weird things, people, weird roles they took on on in the movie that they weren't really hired for. Right. People doing certain editing jobs or bringing their own costumes or, you know, having a big slumber party at the mansion. All mm -hmm. these different things you hear about, you know, a movie like Moonrise Kingdom where they're chipping in because everybody feels like the film is their baby. Right. That's uh, another one of those John Waters things I love. And I think that's probably something we'll see a lot more with Wes Anderson as we figure out more of these movies. So we have this website that would be doublefeatureshow.com. There's a little column on the side of that website, which will now contain Wes Anderson. Oh, actually, you need two movies to go in that column. Uh, well, maybe uh, sometime next year, because we get a whole year now. We do. But, yeah, uh, we do. That's not going to be before we do our Notorious year ending shows. So I think this year's show should just be without comments and we can uh we can discuss a little bit next time what happened here. All right, we're doing RoboCop and Bicentennial Man. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>